Hey everybody, welcome to the Book Leads Impactful Books for Life and Leadership. I'm your series host and leadership performance coach, John Jaramillo. This podcast series is about getting to the books that the people in my network, friends, new colleagues, any professionals with a great story, people that I've met through my network have that have inspired them, contributed to their work, left an impression on them. So these are great leads to get to those books. I want to learn about what it is that the takeaways are from my guests. And the way that I do it is in three categories of books. One category, I might be interviewing them on a book that they have read that I haven't, that they're schooling me on. A second one is where we've both read the same book and we're comparing notes, whether specifically for the episode or in our past lives or outside lives that we're covering that book. And then the third one is when I bring on uh, authors, or author, officers, authors <laughs> or publishers uh, to discuss a book that they have out that they want to discuss the value and the message that they want to get out. So for this particular episode, my guest is Laura Darrell. Laura is a top-selling leadership author and guest speaker, passionate about franchisee and franchisor success, organizational health, and leadership development. She has 25 years of people, team, and departmental leadership experience with some of Canada and the world's most iconic, iconic brands. Excuse me. She holds a master's degree in organizational leadership from Royal, Royal Roads University with thesis research focused on how enhanced collaboration between multidisciplinary key stakeholders can lead to better business outcomes for both. I love how I could get through all that, but I couldn't say authors and publishers <laughs> together. <laughs> anyway, Laura and I met through the network that this podcast is built. She's heard about the show, listened to it, loved what I was doing. So we contacted or she contacted me. We touched base. I love the work that she's doing. And there's an interesting book that she's going to share with us that I have been meaning to get to. I've always heard about, uh, but I haven't gotten to it yet. So, Laura, uh, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm so happy to be here. Um, I love books. I love leadership. And I love this book in particular. So it's going to be a great conversation. See, you're one of my people. <laughs> Laura, so I always start by asking my guests who they are today. Again, I've read the bio, um, Gabe, you know, mi minimal information about your background, but what does your work look like today? Can you give us some of the ins and outs of what your typical work lo looks like with clients, whether it's workshops, whether it's coaching, whatever it may be, what does all that look like today? Yeah, it's a great question. I am. Um, so my husband and I retired to Mexico City a couple of years ago. Um, you know, I had a, a great um, job in Canada. I was leading a, a really big organization from an operations perspective. Um, loved it. But then, like most people through through COVID, I think, you know, our perspectives changed a little bit. And so I had this executive role, as did my husband. And we were both traveling all the time. Um, and then COVID hit and we both were grounded and it was like, okay, so we need to make some changes to, yeah, to more closely live our lives with our purpose and what we really valued. So, you know, after a couple of years, that's when we decided um, to pack up our life in Canada and move to Mexico City. And I really was curious about, you know, what was I going to do with my time? I, I know that my purpose and my passion um, is all around leadership and how can we take, you know, some of the bigger things going on in the world today and really just focus a little bit on where we can make a mark in the world to hopefully make things a little bit better uh, for, for people everywhere. And that for me is around leadership, because I just believe that if you've got great leaders in organizations that care about their people, they invest in their development, they coach them, um, they appreciate them, that that employee's experience um, at work is going to be infinitely better. They're going to take that home with them. Their stress is going to be less. It's, I just think it can have such a profound impact um, on the world. And so that that's my jam these days. I've, I've written uh, three books now, and they're all really geared around um, leadership and relationships and collaboration and taking care of people, taking care of relationships. So that's where I try to hang my hat. Um, I do speaking engagements um, at you know conferences, at organizations. Um, I take on a client or two, um, but really it just ha it has to match my values and my purpose. You have to be an organization that really deeply cares about your people and you want to up your leadership game to make that experience even better. That typically seems to be where, where I'm hanging my hat these days. And uh, yeah, I, I just find great purpose in it. Um, makes me smile. So I think I'm on the right track. 
Yeah, I love that. Yeah, you're saying I think I'm on the right track. But I mean, you know what? I mean, it's come up in this uh, in this series where it's kind of like I know from my own experience, I don't have it quite nailed. I've told people that my business has kind of evolved and shifted and never looks the same from year to year. But as long as I'm going in the right direction, as long as I'm making my revenue where I, you know it needs to be to make a living, I mean, I'd rather kind of keep working in that same direction than yeah. than then get a paycheck or get paid just based on one particular thing that I'm not too sure of that I, yeah. I'm okay with working in the general direction and, and letting it evolve. Yeah. Um, and you know, everybody kind of has that feeling of whether or not it's right for them. Yeah. A hundred percent. And uh, yeah, I mean, I look back at my, my time kind of in the pre the pre COVID era and like, I loved, I loved my job. I loved the organization that I worked for and I loved you know, certain aspects of the work gave me great purpose. So how I led my team and my departments and how I showed up for those guys and, you know, appreciated them and, and developed them and coached them. And when they would get promoted, like nothing would bring me greater happiness than seeing um, that work with my team. And then the work that I did with franchisees and just helping to bridge that gap between franchisors and franchisees and get everybody on the same page and, you know, even though we're in this like interdependent system, like we, mm. we need each other, we need. And so it's like family, right? So I, I took great purpose from that. But then, of course, a bunch of other things, you know, didn't bring me a lot of joy. So just happy to be in this space now where, um, yeah, I just I just will talk about leadership to anybody that will listen. I just think it's such an important <laughs> and underrated like, oh, my God, do you want to make the world a better place, friends? Let's focus yeah. on the caliber of leadership that exists in the world today. Yeah, I think there there's just so much. And I have like this newsletter I put out where it's kind of like I'm sick of talking and hear me out. I'm sick of talking about leadership because there is a lot of cookie cookie cutter stuff out there. But like what you're saying, like working with people the day in, day out, knowing their stories, knowing that what you can kind of help them craft to put together, to work together, yeah. whether it's a franchisee, a franchisor, the connection. I think there's just so much more to leadership than maybe we've always known, especially during the pandemic. I think there's a deeper humanity that I now see in the importance of the work. Yeah. Um, yeah. Does that, th does that sound crazy or? No, 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 no. Like I'm with you. I think that um, for me, leadership is about the fundamentals. Like I just call it the good human factor. You know, mm. how do you just show up and be a good human and, get the fundamentals right. And I think yeah. one of the worst things that can happen to the subject of leadership is that it just gets all, you know, cluttered with buzzwords and, oh, this is the leadership focus of the, yeah. you know, I, I don't think that does service to, to the work. I really think that aside from, you know, being a parent, raising children and, uh, you know, maybe some of the folks that are in those like life-saving professions, I put leadership of people like right underneath those two, those two functions, because honestly, I mean, you hold people's careers in your hands, you hold their, you know, how, how happy they are at work every day, how they show up when they go back home to their family, to their partner, mm. to their, I just think people don't, um, they don't give it the, the thoughtfulness that it deserves that, you know, your job as a leader is to serve your people and it's to invest in them and take care of them. Um, not to serve yourself and to serve your own, your own gains. Yeah. I love how you mentioned that it's about like what they bring home to their families too, that, it, that that's a piece of it. Uh, just because the more that I've worked in leadership, it's like, it, it's weird because it goes more and more away. The work that they have to do goes more and more away from just leading people that it is about that human factor that you brought yeah. up. I've said that ad nauseum here, like the pandemic has just shown us a different light of hu a different side of humanity. Yeah. than I guess we're used to because we're kind of forced to, but you know, now that we see it, we can tap into it. Uh, but I think it is very important because all those kinds of lessons, you're right, carry, carry over from one group. You may be overseeing or guiding to, you know, whether you're a parent at home, your kids, I've mentioned how I have certain conversations with my kids where it's, you know, coaching, yeah. Um, you know, down, down to a level that they can understand, but hoping that they take the same lessons away. So I love that you tie in that it's not just about what they do in the workplace, but that you are, you, when you are really intentional with your leadership, it is about making them better and ourselves better, uh, through that ripple effect of just their actions and how it carries out into their environments. hundred percent. I think a lot of leaders don't appreciate, um, 
the impact that they have on people's lives directly. There's some really interesting research that came out of, it's called the Karolinska Institute in Sweden. And um, the the lady there, it's Anna something, I'll, I'll, I'll flip it over to you. But, you know, she did her doctoral research in studying the outcomes of two different groups of, of cohorts, you know, one cohort that had, you know, I think what we would call kind of like bad leadership, you know, mm -hmm. someone that doesn't care about their people, very stressful environment, all the things that we would say not to do when you're when you're leading people in teams. And then she followed the second group that had great leadership. They were doing all the right things, caring about their people, all, all that type of um, dynamic. And so she followed them over a number of years, particularly paying attention to their health outcomes. So when they had like whether it was a heart issue, a medical issue, um, she was really curious about what these two scenarios would do from a health outcome perspective. And uh, I don't think surprising to to any of us that you know study the study this um, you know the leadership dynamic. Uh, the folks that had great leadership that had great environments to go to work in every day, they had far better outcomes from a health perspective than those that didn't. And I think it's just time that everybody start paying attention to. If you as a leader create a really stressful environment, a stressful dynamic in your company, in your department, on your team, that stressful dynamic doesn't stop when the clock you know, hits five o'clock. Like people carry that stress home with them mm -hmm. to all aspects of their life. And that's why I think that leadership is just, it's such a important position. And um, yeah, I just think we, we, gotta, we gotta start getting it right because stress is not good for, for anybody. Yeah, to me, it's nothing short of, I said this about writing, just how great writing is um, when you can inspire somebody through your message. But for me, great leadership is just magic. Yeah, You know what I mean? Because you're not, you're not really creating something. Um, hear me out. You're not creating something. You're pointing things out. You're showing people their capabilities. You're showing people where to go for resources. You're showing people the hope, like the future, what's possible. And it's just... It's amazing to me. It can be magic because yeah. I, I've I've been around great leaders, and when you see them in action, and they are as selfless as you've shared, that they are about other people. What do you need, and not so much, you know, this is where we need to go. Just follow me, trust me, kind of thing. It's amazing what happens, and yeah. and I've seen that experience in the last couple of years, especially with the pandemic, of a poor leader and where it leaves people. Like that poor leadership burns people out, uh -huh. even even before they do the work. Yeah even before they have to tackle the work that they've kind of been demanded to do yeah. just the, the, the tension that exists and the way that that person communicates themselves undermines people, doesn't trust people, talks down yeah. to people, all of that. And, and you know, I'm in my forties and, and I, I was around that for a while and I could, I've never felt tension in my body like that. 100%. Uh, and it would take me a while coming back home from that environment, witnessing that. Um, so yeah, just the, I, I hope more comes out about that kind of literature that ties physiological condition to yeah. what you experience mentally, emotionally in the workplace like that. So that's yeah. a great point. Yeah. I call it the, you know, the, do you pass the Sunday afternoon, 4 PM leadership test? Like, are that, you certain <laughs> that your folks aren't wherever they are on Sunday afternoon yeah. at four o'clock and feeling that? Cause if you've ever felt that, I, I've worked yeah. in, in one organization where I felt that it would be three, four o'clock every Sunday. And it's just, it just dread, like just dread creeps into your stomach. It takes over your thinking. And now you're spending the rest of your weekend kind of dreading what's going to happen, um, you know, when you show up at work on Monday morning. So I always used to love to ask the leaders on my team, like, are, are you certain that your folks, it's, you know, four o'clock on Sunday, how, how are they feeling about showing up to work with you? um tomorrow because if you're uncertain then you need to do a little bit of reflection um and i love the way you call it magic right because it is magic i think the job of the leader is to create this space for amazing things to happen it's your job to believe that the the people that you're leading um are capable of greatness because if you yeah. believe that in them oh my goodness i think we've all worked for that one leader that believed in you when you didn't even believe in yourself. And I think what's really powerful in those moments is um, just the, the profound impact that that belief um, can have in your team and in the individuals on your team. And, you know, I love that about Coach Wooden, and I know we're going to talk about him shortly, but, oh man, like he, 
just epitomizes that, like just believe in, in everybody has greatness in them. And your job as the leader is to just bring that out, create the space where that can, where that can happen. Yeah. And, and I love the way in the last couple of minutes, I think the message from both of us has been that people need to take into account, um, not even leaders that may have poor leadership that are impacting people, but even someone who's not in a leadership position, just anybody that puts that kind of trust in somebody, uh, provides some kind of guidance, uh, has some faith and hope, like all the soft stuff, right? I don't want them to underestimate just how much of a ripple effect that has, that leadership doesn't stop at the door, that the no. good, the great impact doesn't stop at the door. People, you see, you really do see a little pep in someone's step. If you're comparing a poor leader versus a great leader, just when somebody's leaving work, they can actually leave refreshed because yes. you've tapped into the right kind of energy when they're in the workplace. Yeah. Whereas, you know, I've been there, you're, you're leaving your head down, you're fucking wiped, you have yeah, no energy you're left, you're, you're done. So I love that we brought that up. I, you know, even though we talk about leadership on this series, I don't think we've quite painted it like that. So just for me, that magic of leadership, please, anybody out there that has any kind of um, question about their leadership, think about the, that impact that goes outside the door because it, yeah. it's amazing. Now, Laura, why, why, why the jump from Canada to Mexico city? <laughs> <laughs> if you don't mind me asking. Uh, no, it's a great question. So my husband and I actually came to Mexico City um, on vacation about 10 years ago um, and just fell in love. Like I, we, so as a Canadian, like we all, all the Canadians go down to Mexico in the winter, it gets real cold and we go down <laughs> south. So we went to all the, we've been to all the beach places around Mexico, uh, had a great time. But when we came to Mexico City, I think we really saw the true Mexican culture. I mean, the art, the history, the food, the people, the weather, the neighborhoods, the trees, the greenery, the parks, like it's just a really, really magical place. And when we were thinking about, okay, so what do we want to do for the next 10 years? We hadn't done any traveling into South America whatsoever. So we thought, gosh, this would be a great place to base ourselves. Um, so that we can explore South America. And of course, our snowbird, snowbird parents, we're pretty pleased too. Like Jim's folks, that's my husband. His folks are here. They live just down the street from us. My mom winters here in the winter now. So yeah, it's oh, just- really? Uh, that's amazing. Yeah, it's it's a beautiful, beautiful spot. And honestly, I just don't think this city gets the, the cred that it deserves. Like it is, well, I think that's changing quite a bit. Yeah, days. and at the same time, I don't think you want to- put that out there because no. you'll just have like people invading it's a terrible spot like, terrible yeah spot. yeah exactly <laughs> don't, don't make the move <laughs> now lord uh, to get to what your your background is or your work is now can you walk me a little bit through your trajectory where it started when you were younger when you were starting your career whether it was education whether it was influenced by parents uh happy sense what was it that kind of put you on that path to now even though you may not have known that you were going to end up here. What did those first couple steps of building your career uh, and education, if that's the case, look like? Sure. It's a great question. Um, so I was raised on a farm uh, in, in the province of Ontario in Canada by two um, immigrant parents. So my mom came over to Canada from, from England, um, which was great. She came over in the 60s. Um, but my dad's story is a little bit, um, you know, more unique. So he escaped Czechoslovakia in 1968 when the Russians um, kind of invaded and took over and became a communist country. So he left everything. He left his family. Uh, he left his career. He left his friends um, to escape to uh, also to Ontario. So he went through Austria and made his way eventually um, to Canada. So. Why that's important in, in my story is I think because it instilled the values in me that I still hold today. So obviously growing up on a farm, uh, work ethic is just, it's just part of the equation. And I've carried that through my whole life. Um, and from a career perspective, I didn't go to university. Like I didn't get a master. I got my master's degree about four or five years ago. I didn't have a bachelor's degree. So I had to do this, this rigorous process to even be accepted into the program because I didn't have any of the educational prerequisites. 
but again, I think that that value of hard work that like that didn't scare me. Like I was not scared off by the process. I knew this is something that I wanted to do. I knew leadership was, you know, just something that I've been super passionate about my whole life. So that's kind of the education piece it didn't happen until much, much later for me. But this, um, you know, the impacts of my dad and the things we talked about at the kitchen table, things about the importance of, you know, freedom and that you, you do whatever you want to do and don't let anybody tell you that you can't, you can't do those things. My dad really believed that freedom was just so critical, freedom of expression, freedom of thought, freedom of religion, freedom to be what you want. Those were the conversations that as I was very, very young, those are the things that my dad talked about because of his experiences um, around the the dining room table. And, you know, I just think I, I look back now at the kind of the life I've lived to this point, um, and that just rings so true for me. I just, I've just always believed that you know, I can do anything. I, I can be any anybody that I want to be. And that really shows up in my leadership too, because I have that belief about everybody, that you are going to be amazing at something, whatever it is that you want to do. Um, so I, I really believe in that. I believe in just the way, uh, you know, I think about my mom and she just had this really, has this really unique way of just be be positive. Whatever happens, just try and you know, put a smile on your face and find the good, find the good in all the situations, good and bad. And so I just think about how those kind of three values came together for me, this like, be positive, look for the good in people, look for the good in situations, this work ethic, and this belief that everybody has this right to, you know, be free to live their best life possible. I think those th three things came together um, to, to set me on this course to, to want to lead people, to inspire people, to pour myself into people. And it's funny because I didn't really have a lot of career aspirations. Like I didn't grow up and be like, oh, I want to be a lawyer. I want to be a doctor. I want to be this. I want to be that. I didn't really have any of those things. I wanted to see the world. I was really passionate about seeing and experiencing different cultures. And I knew I really believed in hard work. And so when I kind of got my first job um, at a and restaurants many, many moons ago, yeah. I just I just worked my butt off and I was a really positive person. I looked for the good in situations and I challenged myself and it just set me off on this career where I, I got promoted into my first leadership role. And I just saw the impact that that had, even in such a you know small leadership role at that time, I saw the impact that that had on the folks that I worked with every day. And that was it. I was hooked. That set me on the trajectory to, well, I just want to be the best leader that I can possibly be. Really didn't matter what industry I worked in. I just believe that leadership transcended industry. And if you were an amazing leader, I could teach you about the widgets. You could learn about, you know, mm. oh, we're selling this here. We're doing that here. Leading people is a very unique skill unto itself. I think it doesn't matter what industry you work in. So can you continue that? So once you got into that leader, leadership position, what did your path look like between then and now? Yeah, I just kept like working hard and I just had this kind of just say yes philosophy, you know, so they would, oh, hey, are you interested in this role? Yes, I am. I'd, I'd love to try that. And then I went from, you know, the, the general manager role in the restaurant world to the general manager of restaurants that needed a turnaround. And oh man, I loved that because you were just taking this, you know, team of people that people hadn't been invested in and they hadn't been appreciating and coaching and taking care of and the same on the customer side. And you got to be the person that brought that um, into the environment. So I, I loved doing that. Then I was promoted to like regional manager roles. Uh, and then I, you know, changed the changed industries a little bit. I went to work um, as a senior manager at Apple. Then I went to work in like the recruitment world to learn all about, you know, how do you source great talent? How do you attract them to your organization? So that kind of shifted my thinking a bit. Um, and then it really ended at uh, Boston Pizza was the, the last organization that I work for. And um, I was promoted into the vice president role. So I had three departments, um, 400 restaurants across Canada, 20,000 employees in, in the restaurants at that time. 
So that for me was really the bringing of it all together. That's where I did my master's degree. And I thought, gosh, you know, I've had all this great uh, like boots on the ground experience, which is not uncommon in the restaurant world for a lot of people mm -hmm. to follow that path. Um, and I really wanted to get a little bit of technical training um, to go with that kind of boots on the ground. And that's when I did my master's degree. And that really just, oh my gosh, it, it, I didn't even think it was possible to expand my leadership <laughs> thinking that much, but yeah. man, it it sure did. And yeah, and then here I am today. Yeah, I love the the idea. Um, just like the immigrant parents, your mom with the yes attitude, your dad with the freedom of just do whatever you can. Um, my own parents are immigrants, and I've heard a lot of my guests talk about their their parents being immigrants and their experience, and just the fact that it, that foundation that it provides you. Um, you know, my my dad coming to this country, or my parents coming to this country, working hard, blue collar jobs. And then me working in a white collar job. So it's far different. Yeah. You know, it, <laughs> I've joked, you know, temp temperature regulated environments that I work <laughs> in, like it's just, it's coasting compared to what yeah. they went through. Yeah. Um, so I, I think there, it's that message from like immigrant parents to their kids that they may have wherever they land. It's kind of like, yeah. you know, this is what I went through. This is what I saw. Yeah. recognize what it is that you're able to build and design and that, yeah, you can be anything that you want. So our, our paths parallel in that, in that mm -hmm. image and that idea. So it's just ingrained in my mind. Yeah. And, and when I've recently really taken stock of it during the pandemic of where my work ethic came from, where my efficiency as even an interviewer um, in networking as a, whatever it may be, all of that stems. And I say, I love education, got my bachelor's degree, a couple of master's degrees. That doesn't hold a candle to what I learned from my immigrant yeah. parents about yes. hard work, how you treat each, you know, other people. It's just amazing. And, yeah. and I hope that other people that do come from that immigrant story can recognize if it's there, what what those lessons really are. Cause that that yeah. really is my foundation. And it sounds like it was not sounds like you explained how it's 100%. so much yours. A hundred percent. Like for me, those are Oh my gosh! Can can we back? Can we get back to a place where those fundamental values become kind of the bedrock of of, of what we teach our kids? Right, like the value of of worth ethic, work ethic. I think is just man that has seen me through some tough times. Right, like okay, well, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna settle in, and I'm just gonna you know I'm just gonna be gritty, and I'm just gonna work hard, and something good is gonna happen. And I just think that work ethic and you know, positivity, be a good human, treat, treat people well. Gosh, I think if we could just double down on, on, on those types of values and those types of principles, that too is going to have a profound impact um, on, on kids in the world. And, and again, why I love, why I think I was so attracted to, to Coach Wooden and his work, because his, his upbringing is very, very similar. His foundational beliefs are very, very similar. And I just think it attracted me to, and of course, like the wild success this man had, um, was super interesting as well. <laughs> so based on what you've told me, that path that you took me through, um, again, no one can really pinpoint where they're going to land in yeah. the future, but does it make sense from your childhood that this is where you are? This is the kind of work that you're doing? Yeah. I, I just, I look at kind of the life that, that we've built over the last couple of years. And, you know, I, I really wondered what I was going to do with my time, um, but now I just, I look at what I'm doing today and yeah, like I'm, I'm talking about leadership. I'm trying to inspire people to be a good human being and take care of your people and man, just work hard and settle in and don't quit when it gets difficult. Um, I think people need to hear that, uh, those messages and yeah, it would kind of make sense that, um, well, it would kind of make sense that, um, I'm doing the things that I'm doing. Uh, right now, it, it just feels like I'm talking about all the things that my parents taught me and, mm. you know, all the stories from my journey uh, to this point. Um, so, yeah, I think it, it makes sense. Awesome. Even before we jump into the book, can you, Laura, why don't you give us a little more about the books that you've written? Um, just briefly, like how you came yeah. to write the books, what they're about, uh, you know, obviously titles and whatnot. And then I'm also curious when you are doing your or carrying out your speaking engagements, what your keynotes are, what your signature talks are, what are those messages? 
I know the general message, but what is it yeah. that you convey to those audiences that you're speaking to? Yeah. So um, my first book was called The Great Resignation. And I wrote that as I was exiting my corporate life and into, into this new life, um, really just fresh off the heels of watching what COVID did to the workplace and you know, just caused this huge moments of reflection in people where they were like, oh my goodness, I love my job. I hate my job. I love my boss. I hate my boss. Regardless of what people's sentiments were, there was big, big changes afoot and people leaving, um, you know, resigning their jobs in droves, the, the most we've seen, you know, since they started studying that data. And I didn't want the the moment, I didn't want the, the window on this moment to close with people, you know, only associating the great resignation with this with this COVID moment. Yeah, yes, that was absolutely a part of it. I think it spurred people into into change. Um, but I absolutely believe the what was at the root of those changes: poor leadership, no coaching, no career potential, no appreciation, no recognition, toxic environment. I believe that those things have been the same and around for a very long time. And I wanted to just shine a light on. Like, look, if you have great leaders in your organization and if you have this culture that is built on coaching, development, appreciation and recognition, um, you're going to survive through these moments of great resignations, this one and others to come. You're going to fare a lot better than organizations that have toxic leadership and toxic mm -hmm. environments. And I just didn't want I didn't want that window to close with people just chalking it up to, well, it was the great resignation. That's why people are quitting their jobs um, in droves, because I think that would have done a, a really big disservice to the opportunity that exists organizationally for enhanced leadership to uh, change the experience for their employees. So that book was all about that. One, it was like diagnosing these four or five problems um, that I saw in kind of toxic organizations. And then being solutions focused, I wanted to be like, look, and here, here's the things that you can do as a leader um, to, to turn that narrative around and to turn that experience around. So that was the first book. The second book really came because I was on a podcast and I was talking about the great resignation and describing, you know, this amazing organization with, you know, coaching and development and career progression and all this, you know, rewards and appreciation And the Shelly was her name on the podcast was like, Oh, Laura, you're describing like utopia. What about for everybody else that doesn't work in an organization like that? And it's funny how that was just such a profound statement to me. I was like, Oh, God, you're right. So that spurred on the second book, which is called The Promotability Gap. And that's really meant to help support people that find themselves working in an organization without a leader that cares mm. about them and their development and their career progression. They don't give feedback. They don't have honest conversations about what you need to do to advance your career. So that set me down this huge research path of talking to executives and CEOs and senior leaders across all different industries about what are some of the most common gaps that you see in people's performance that holds them back career wise. So, you know, I kind of landed on what the top five were. And then to be solution focused, part two is all about, so how can you develop on your own without someone championing you? What courses can you take? What books can you read? What exercises can you do? Um, so that was the where the second book came from. And then my last book, The Principles of Franchisee Success, uh, just came out last month. And that really was me settling into my life in the franchised world, what I wrote my thesis about. I just really want to, I have great passion for bringing franchisees and franchisors closer together um, because I do believe that you see system success like unlike any other when those two groups of people work really well together and it's not the norm in the industry it, it tends to be a bit of a tricky relationship you've got entrepreneurs you know starting businesses and building businesses and then you've got all these employees that work for the franchisor and that corporate career path is built very differently than an entrepreneurial journey. And that can leave a lot of um, space to be filled by the differences that each of those groups have instead of focusing from an appreciative stance, all the great things an entrepreneur brings to the table and all the great things that someone really focused on, their organization, their department, their specialty, um, how that can feed into a great relationship too. So that's kind of what uh, the, the third book um, is all about. And I think from like a speaking perspective, it's either down one of, one of those two streams. I'm either speaking 
with franchisees or franchisors. And I'm talking about how do we view each other in our roles from an appreciative stance? That's that appreciative leadership philosophy yep. that I just believe so much in. Look for the things that um, help the situation, help the dynamic, shine a light on the best of each of us. Um, and that's really going to change the working dynamics. So I tend to speak a lot about that subject um, when I'm in the franchised environment. Um, and when I'm not speaking, you know, specifically about franchising, franchisees or franchisors, I really just talk a lot about the purpose of leadership, um, sometimes related to Gen Z's coming into the workplace and, you know, trying to shine a light on a little bit what their journey has been like. And like, it, it hasn't been great. They're, they're, they've got some, some big issues um, that they're facing. And so I like to talk about what specific leadership styles can really um, make an impact with, with that cohort. And for me, it's always about being a coaching leader and an appreciative leader. Um, so I, I tend to talk a lot about those two leadership styles um, to the non-franchise world. But that, I mean, honestly, they, they apply in a franchised environment too. Yeah, yeah. And I love the word appreciative, how you bring that up. <clears throat> it's another thing that may sound like common sense, but... I don't think we really stop and think about, you know, what it takes for the other to go through whatever they're going through. Our partners, our stakeholders, whoever it may be, in your case, yeah. franchisee, franchisor. So I think that's a great word just to kind of get a sense of, again, that path that somebody else is going down. Just that relatability, that it's yeah. not transactional, that it's more relational. You know, everybody's got a stake in this partnership, uh, this combination of forces, this combination of businesses uh, getting things right. So I yeah. love that word appreciative. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so why don't we jump into coach Wooden's book? If you could just, uh, introduce the book and then also at this point, just kind of what, how did you come across the book? What made you read it? So the book is called Wooden on leadership, uh, written obviously, uh, with coach John Wooden. And I, I have to say like, it is the most, um, profound leadership book I've, I've, I've ever read uh, in Ooh, all of the books that I've read. That's a big claim. Read. That's a yeah, big it, claim. It, and I've made I like it that. I like many, that. many times. It is, it's the best book on leadership that, that I've read. And I think that every single um, person that leads teams, sports, organizational families, like whatever that is, you, you need to read this book. Um, it came across my path about 15 or 16 years ago. I was working at Apple at the time and I was at uh, the, the head office in uh, Cupertino. We were at some like networking, organizational networking event. And then this guy that I was being introduced to, we were talking about leadership and he'd asked if I'd ever heard of Coach John Wooden. And that really started it off for me. Um, yeah. And I just think that, oh my gosh, I, do, I don't even know where I would start. But I think you, I, I always like to start with, so here, here's why. Here's why you should listen to what coach John has to say. You know, I think that somebody that wins 10 NCAA championships in 12 seasons, that's never been done before. Well, that that's interesting. Like how, how did you create the environment that that happened? Cause that's a pretty uh, profound statistic unto itself. You know, I think he won 88, his team won 88 games back to back to back to back. It never been done before. Um, really, really, speaks to like at, at a competitive sport at that level to have a team that has come together on that level to achieve those things. Well, I just think any leader would, the, the natural question is like, how? how, how did that happen? Like, who is he as a leader mm -hmm. that created the environment for this, this phenomenal unduplicated success to happen? So that's when I started doing some research on him. I found out all these things and it led me to this book, Wooden on Leadership, which is really, you know, kind of part bi biography about who he is and why he or who he was and why he he thinks the way he does. And then it's the story of his time um, as a coach um, at UCLA. And it just resonated with me right away. I mean, he, he talks about this pyramid of success. It's these fundamental building blocks. Um, it's like the... The, the secret sauce or the secret recipe to creating that magical space. Um, and I would just read through like all those building blocks in, in his pyramid. And I was just, it number one, it resonated with my upbringing. So he too was raised on a farm in Indiana. 
um, had some great adversity in his life. His family lost the farm. They had to move into town. His, you know, dad had to go at work at something that he didn't, you know, maybe love or find great purpose in. Um, but, but just the, the way they dealt with the adversity and the way he just always pushed himself to like, what's next and how can I have an impact? Um, that story really resonated with me. And then of course, you know, I learned a lot about leadership from him. I learned a lot about discipline and the fundamentals and what it takes to be excellent in your craft. I really took that from, from this book. Well, what does that mean, Laura? Like, can you give just an example of maybe how he breaks down excellence and what it meant to him? Yeah. So I think two examples that I would give that really stand out for me is number one, the way he would start the first practice of every season, regardless if you were coming back for your fourth year, if you were a new new member of the team, uh, he started his very first practice the same way each and every year. And he started by teaching everybody how to properly put on your athletic socks and how to put on and tie up, lace up your shoes before you hit the court. And mm -hmm. I just remember reading that and thinking, man, like how many times have I tried to coach people or teach people things? And I start up here mm. when I need to start with like the fundamentals, the, the very most basic things um, that have a significant impact on how you show up. And in this case, it's like, man, you put your shoes on wrong. You tie them up the wrong way, too tight, not too tight. You've got wrinkles in your socks. All of those things are going to impact how you show up on the court to play the game or to, 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 to practice the game. And for me, that was just a real light bulb that was like, man, like stop starting at a hundred thousand feet, like yeah. start on the things that really, really impact performance. So that was one. And the other thing that hugely resonated with me is that every single practice that coach Wooden would uh, facilitate, he took detailed notes, every drill. How did the team show up? How did they leave the practice? What was their energy? What was their mood? Every single drill. And he saved every single one of those practice notes. And when he would start or when he would be preparing himself and his coaching staff to start the next season, he brought out all of those log books from the season before and they read every single reflection about and so these are like pictures of them inside this book and like the detail is phenomenal and for me that was a huge light bulb moment of number one like capture the work capture the recipe the things that you do take time at the end of your day to capture where did you lose time where did you gain time what was really beneficial what left you excited what fulfilled your purpose what felt like sucking time out mm -hmm. of your day how did your team respond all of those nuggets capture those things when you're a leader, because when you go back then and reflect on all of those notes, I'm just, I'm a huge uh, believer of this power of reflection. And then just going through and looking at like 30 days worth of reflection, 90 days, six months worth, what are the common threads that you can pull out of those reflections? What are the themes? Like, what is it telling you about what is, filling you with energy versus zapping your energy? What is leaving your team motivated, inspired, and really engaged? And what is having the opposite effect? Um, so I really took that from, from him, just the, and like the discipline that it takes to write down every single thing in the practice and the drills and how many and how people were feeling. Well, that takes great discipline. But when you look back at his kind of pyramid of success, um, yeah, discipline is there. It's, uh, it's foundational. So did he, not to give away the farm, um, but did, does he break down where he got that? Was it something, I don't know, because there's so much work on a farm, I can imagine you got to meticulous, you have to be meticulous about tracking everything. But did he mention where he picked up that idea and, and just practice of chronicling and journaling everything? Yeah, it, it stems from his, so at the very top of his pyramid, he has something that's called competitive greatness. Um, be at your best when your best is needed and love the hard battles. And to prepare, to, to be at your competitive greatness requires preparation. And he really believed that, you know, his, his player's job was to show up 
give it a hundred percent, be a great team, you know, team player, get on that field and compete or get on that court and compete every day. And he viewed his job as the leader. His job was to be um, at his competitive greatness, every practice. And, and to do that, um, you know, he wouldn't run suicides or do all the drills that his team was doing, but his work was to capture every moment, capture, you know, all of the nitty gritty details so that he could go back and reflect and make tweaks so that practice got better and better and better um, with each practice that he conducted. He believed uh, wholeheartedly that um, you never need to worry about the game. Am I going to win the game? I'm going to lose the game. What's the game going to be like? He he never talked. He never talked about the game. He put everything, every big bet was into the practice. It's how we practice. It's how we prepare. You don't even, he, he used to say, like, you don't even need to look at the, the scoreboard. The scoreboard doesn't mean anything. The real score is how you show up to practice. And if you give it all in the practice, like you would give it in the game, you don't ever have to worry about the outcome of the game. And I just think that really uh, became apparent um, <clears throat> in, in, in his results. Yeah, that's huge because that just came up in another episode of this series where I think my guest and I were talking about maybe I forget if it was about speaking or blogging, but it was about um, or even podcasting. I think it came up across, up across a couple of different episodes, but the 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 idea was maybe I, I think I was talking to somebody previously on this show and about what they wanted to share in a podcast, but they didn't think that they would get to it just because there are so many out there. So then my other guest and I talked about that kind of idea and it's like, you know, if you have something inside you that you have to get out, out of yourself, whether it's a blog, whether it's a podcast, whether it, whatever it may be, get it out of yourself, yeah. do the work. And Edie, my 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 late my later guest, my subsequent guest, had said something to the effect of just she learned in one of the books that she covered about letting go, letting go of the result. And it parallels very much what you're talking yes. about. I love that fact that it's like we're so tied to what the result may be for obvious reasons. Let's sure. just put it out there. You know, it, we we run businesses, we want to make sure people take away the best that they can. Uh, universities are businesses yes. as well. You want to make sure that the team is winning, of course. Uh, but if you get so focused on what people are taking away at the end, it's more about where the focus is. Yeah. If you take so much focus away from the work and they're just solely focused on that result, your 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 head isn't in the game, your mind is in the game. So I appreciate that you bring that up because yeah. I've just realized that so much where it's like, listen, it. I, I do want people to enjoy when I'm speaking, podcasting, of course, but you and I right here today, we're going to pour what we can, bringing it from the practices, the reps yeah. that we've done, you and your work, me and my work. We're going to have a great conversation. We're going to talk about all these different things. I'm going to learn about you in Mexico City and your parents going down there, you know, just little lessons that we pick up yeah. from each other. And then I set it and forget it. Yeah. You know what? I set it and forget it. I publish it and I'm, I make a promise to all my guests that I'm going to do the best that I can by you as my guest. I respect you as my guest. I, I'm not going to put out a, a product out there that I don't think is is worthy of um, of just um, that isn't worthy of someone's attention. I want to make sure that I highlight and profile my authors, my my guests in the best light. But yeah, if we can pour what we can into this moment, again, coming from the reps we did, set it and forget it. I mean, that's all you can do. And and that's one of my best, the the best takeaways I took from um, the four agreements. Um, I don't know if you've read that book, Laura, have you? I have to tell you, I'm smiling because I'm looking at my wall right behind my desk and I literally have the four agreements framed. Yeah. The first thing I look at, it's like, it's right so there. So I love that book. And one of the, the best takeaways that I took that's so good, damn simple, is just do your best. That's the last one. It's like, do you, he said he pretty much says, Hey, do your best. I'm like, oh my God, this is groundbreaking. Do my best. <laughs> like, holy shit. Like, this guy's insane. He's a, he's amazing. But it's it's one of those things, Laura, like what we talked about, that you may have the lessons out there, but you don't really yeah. drive it home. Leadership yeah. is important. Leadership is important. Okay, tell me why. Exactly. And then you you tell your story. I tell my story. So this so the the story behind, and I keep pointing up here because it's right up here. 
the story behind why he says that obviously goes into um, the merit of thinking that way. And it, it is, it is true. Do the best you can. Yeah. If you, if you did the best you can and it didn't work out, what there's nothing you else be, you could have done. There's nothing else you can. And, and mine is my thought process is there's nothing else you could have done here, but that just means that your effort and your value are meant to be matched somewhere yeah. else. So yeah. don't give up because it's all a game of numbers, but I love that he such a, a respected coach in his craft and his field thought about that way. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Don't look at the score. Like just no. put in your practice, deliver what you're supposed to, meaning your effort, and then whatever happens, happens. Yeah. Well, and I think if you go back and listen to some of his interviews, I think um, Tony Robbins way back in the day did like one of the first long form interviews that he did was with um, Coach Wooden. And yeah, I mean, if you just go back and listen to some of the things that he's he said, like he really believes or really believed that um, his job was, yes, he's a basketball coach, but his job was to pour himself into these young men and help teach them things that would serve them well into the future, well off of the basketball court. And if you look at the amount of the, the, co the, the individuals that he coached, I mean, I, I, I won't even try to remember the statistics, but the amount of them that became doctors and heads of organizations and went on to do these really profound things in their career. And then of course, yes, you know, many went on to the MBA as well, mm -hmm. but he really believed that his job as the leader was to coach these young men in such a way that delivered upon them life skills that they would take with them into the future. And I think that you can easily translate that to anybody that leads a team, a department in an organization, you have your own company, you need to, to think outside of the result, outside of the job that you want your people to do. You need to focus on what can you teach the, the, the people that work, that work for you? What can you impart on them? What skills can you give them that will serve them well into the future? And those are the things that I think um, get lost a lot because you, you know, folks focus too much on hard skill. They focus too much on must make this many widgets by this mm. time by, you know, it's too much kind of KPI. Like those things are important. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. The world's got, the world's got to go on. But I think yeah. if we could spend more time as leaders uh, coaching and developing people on the people skills, the soft skills, the, you know, the value of work ethic, the value of integrity, the, the, the value of the, the thinking of, you know, the carrot is um, more effective than the stick. And I love the way, because Coach Wooden used to say that all the time, like the carrot is more effective than the stick. And he was just so far ahead of his time, because today we call that appreciative leadership. We call that <laughs> shining a light on all the things that are going amazing and finding people's like superpower and just amplifying that and the power of please and thank you and well done and I appreciate you. Um, like why, why aren't we teaching those things, um, to, to leaders? Because for me that that's, that's the fundamental, like that, that's the foundation. Those are the things not related to widgets that if you are that type of leader, it doesn't matter where you go work, what your KPIs are, what your manager wants. If you lead through these more behavior-based people-based leadership principles, um, you're going to find much more success for starters, both the team and your career and your organization, but you're going to impart things on the folks that you're leading. You're going to role model behaviors and actions that they can take with them to their marriage, to their kids, to their little league team, to their church, to their you know, to, to anywhere they go in life. And those are the things that, man, like if we just double down on those, you're, you're going to make the world a better place, like one purpose or one person uh, at a time. Yeah. I, uh, again, I've, I've heard of coach Wooden. I've heard of his books. I've been meaning to get to his book. Um, I don't have, I don't know much about his background, but one thing that always stood out Anytime I did see it online, like there's a picture of there's a there's two pictures side by side with Coach Wooden. There's one where he's coaching Kareem Abdul-Jabbar um, when he was his coach, 
And then there's one later, later in life, maybe like 25, 30 years where Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is like holding his hand and like yeah. helping him along. Like he's like that, that kind of stuff makes me want to cry because you're coming back to somebody who made such an impact on your life. Yes. That's amazing. Like when yeah. that just shows that, okay, you, you didn't just manage me or supervise me here to get a result and I have no connection. No, you changed my life. Like that just shows a lot of respect that um, that that you would capture that kind of moment where in one moment one is helping the other in the yeah. next you know years later they're returning that favor out of such a, a deep um, respect that they have for them. That's just moments like that are just amazing to me. That's what it's about is um, just kind of paying it forward that ripple effect of humanity. And sometimes yeah, you can you can pay it back to the coach in those moments. Well, and there are so many stories. Um, outside of that one example that was really beautiful photographs, I thought, um, but there's so many stories like that related to how everybody that played basketball, not everybody, but almost everybody that played basketball for him, um, how they felt about him and his wife mm. and his family and just how close that dynamic was. He treated them all like family. That's one of his 12 um, kind of principles for leadership is that you know, you, tr you treat your team like family. And, you know, one of the other things that I really got from him was that if you're not prepared to love your people, leadership is not for you. And I remember reading that and thinking, love is a very strong word. Like, I don't know that I would have <laughs> thought about yeah. it in the context of, of leadership. But I remember reading that and I just remember how I felt and how it inspired me to, to love the people. And then I think about a lot of the coaching that I've given since, since that moment in time. Number one, I can't tell you the amount of times I bought this book and given this book away. I'm probably on my 20th copy by now. I've bought copies for whole teams that I've been leading um, because that, that, that feeling of like, you, you need to love your people. You need to invest in them. The only way you're gonna do that job of the leader justice is by loving your people. You're not always going to like them. He draws very clear distinction between like, I'm going to love you like family. Like this yeah. team is a family and I am going to love everybody on this team. I'm not going to like you all the same. I'm not going to treat you all the same, but I'm going to love you. And I'm going to love this like a family. And man, I just think that that's what it takes. Like earlier you talked about the magic of leadership. Like that for me is the magic when the leader just, they, they just love the people. They just, they love, they love their team. They do anything they can to support them, to help them, to encourage them, to give them the tools and the resources and like the, the tough conversations to, to not shy away from like when you're not at your best, when you're not giving it a hundred percent, when something has happened that we could have taken a different path. There was a different option. Um, I think oftentimes, because those conversations can be really difficult, mm -hmm. leaders shy away from them. And um, you're, just, you're just not doing the job justice when, when you don't have those difficult conversations, because it's in those moments that people really grow. They have an opportunity to reflect. Um, and I just think you, you, don't, you don't do people justice when you, when you shy away from those types of conversations. So Laura, you've given a, an amazing overview, like so many great nuggets about um, Coach Wooden in general, the book specifically. But then if somebody picks up the book, what is that? What is the the overarching story or path of the book? What does that look like? Is it the 12? Is it the principles? Is it the pyramid? How is it that the book is broken out? What kind of path uh, does it take the reader on? Yeah, it's a great question. So the pyramid is right up front um, before you even get into um, the, the chapters of the book, which are modeled after these 12 principles, 12 leadership philosophies um, that he has. And I think the path it takes you on um, is he just draws really unique parallels between, yes, this is a sports world, and yes, my success came in basketball, but these philosophies, this pyramid, these behaviors, these principles can be applied anywhere to any team, to any organization, any department, anywhere where you show up to lead people. These principles um, act as very good 
um, beacons to, to kind of guide you on your journey. I think that you can have tremendous, um, you know, this book can have a lot of impact if you're a brand new leader or if you've been leading people for decades. Um, to, to me, it's timeless. And I don't know, like I started with this book with the pyramid. Um, that's what really jumped out for me is this kind of pyramid of success. And then I really started to look at um, how I was showing up as a leader for my team at this time. It was earlier on in my career, about 15 years ago made me really think about like the foundation, like, okay, how am I onboarding people to my team? How am I training people on my team? What am I really highlighting through those first 90 days? And does it really mirror the, the, the behaviors and the, the type of character that, that I want the team to be known for? So that pyramid really um, helped prioritize things for me specifically on that foundation. Um, that was really, really uh, important to me that I got the foundation right. And the foundation, whether I was at Apple or Starbucks or wherever I was working at the time, mm -hmm. uh, the foundation was always about, you know, how you treat people, love the people, care about your people. Um, work ethic is really important. Um, enthusiasm. And it's funny because I see so much of my parents like in, in my values, like this whole, the enthusiasm piece is uh, one of the cornerstones of the foundation of his pyramid. And that's all about like, find what brings you joy, show the joy, look for the positive, you know, bring energy, bring enthusiasm, because that is just an essential element to team success. And then it's funny because on the other side of the pyramid, the other cornerstone um, is all about industriousness and work ethic and just be gritty and just find a way and just like sink into it. Um, so yeah, that the pyramid is what really resonated for me. And I think that, um, yeah, it's, it's probably a really good place to start. Like if you, if you haven't explored any of his writings, he's got a number of books out too, by the way, this is just, just one of them. Um, but I think that pyramid of success is very, very tangible in helping you reflect as a leader and do I do all the things that ladder up to competitive greatness, which is mm. really my team showing up when they need to show up and really loving the hard battle. Because I think a lot of times, you know, things get hard and people want to just, you know, throw their chips in and, and call it a day. But man, that's where the real gains come is from those that get into those moments where life is hard, work is hard, some, something is difficult. Um, the real gains are made when you lean into that and you just fight your way through it um, and come out the other side. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Um, just talking about the hard things and tackling them. And I, I don't think that's stressed enough when we're growing up. Uh, I know. I mean, from when I was in school, I don't know what it's like now. Um, I think we're given tools as as kids and and students, but I don't think we were quite given the right ones at that time. But stressing that message of you know taking it to the battle, preparing, um, just all those little things. Like I just think there's there's so many reasons for it, but I think the mental health issues that we see, you know, they they may have always been there, but uh, I think school prepares you a lot with certain tools to to get a job, but not necessarily to you know, navigate life. Um, and I think it is normal to, to, to have to encounter battles, but I don't think that was stressed enough when we were younger. So yeah. that, you know, his students were very, his, his athletes were very lucky to come across that kind of impression where, listen, you're going to come up against shit in the everyday and we're going to practice and we're going to be ready for it. And again, put the best you can into it. And then whatever happens afterwards, you know, as long as you try your best, exactly. it is what it is. I don't think you hear that too much when you're, no. I can't remember ever hearing that as a kid coming up. I, I joked about it a couple months ago or last fall when I was um, maybe at the school playground with my kid, he was on the playground and there was like a team playing and these kids were like maybe five or six and the coach is yelling at them. Like they're the world cup team that just lost the match. It's like, what does that really get you? Um, again, that's just red meat masculinity taking play. I, I don't know, but I, I do love that that mentality of being prepared for the fight. Yes. So much of what I've been reading is about that preparation. And in some of the books that I've read, it's kind of like this person is nuts. Like David Goggins. Like, oh, you know, my he's always God. Have you read? What's that book called? 
I, I read Can't Hurt Me, but he does have another follow-up that just yeah. came out a few months ago. And um, there's another author, uh, Brad Ritter, School of Grit, um, where he attended a, a weekend of training that, that simulates the Navy SEALs Hell Week because he was sitting in his office successful at what he did, but something was missing. He felt yeah. like something was calling him. Um, and the reason I mentioned them is because Brad's now into those kind of things. Like, what can I do? That's hard. What can I do? That's hard. And with him and Goggins, and I think I mentioned this to Brad, I did wonder why are these guys doing this? Like what, what is it they're preparing for? Mm -hmm. But at the same time was when I had my revelation about the power of moments, like whatever's in the future is in the future. It's what you're doing now. So the way they prepare, the way they train, the people that they're inspiring in the everyday, for me, that's where that kind of magic is. You know, I don't think anything's going to necessarily come at them that, that, that preparation, um, really calls for like, uh, knock on wood, going to war, going to a fight or anything, yeah. but just their story, their preparation, the people they inspire, that ripple effect. It yeah. always comes back to that ripple effect is just powerful. 100%. And it's funny because Coach Wooden in his kind of pyramid, in the middle of the pyramid um, is conditioning. And that's all about how you prepare, how you show up, how you build skill. And then he ties that to one of his leadership principles which is to seek significant change. And, mm. you know, I remember when I read about that kind of 15 years ago, and then I went, when I was, you know, going through the book this weekend, preparing for our, for our chat today. Oh man, that seek significant change. Just it, it jumped out at me. And that's another funny thing about this book. Cause I've gone back to it a million times, something different every time jumps out. And for me this time it was to seek significant change and to, get comfortable with the uncomfortable because if you're not if you don't ever feel uncomfortable you're absolutely not growing you are stagnating in whatever it is that you're doing like embrace the messy embrace the i'm just gonna blow this up right now because because it needs to be because i'm stuck or i need to move forward or i need to shift my thinking i have a i have a new appreciation for chaos and I think it comes from the pandemic. I think chaos is just kind of like, listen, you can't control it. It kind of gives you permission to start over. Yeah. Uh, it can be very ugly. I'm not going to lie. Not all situations are the same, but I have a very deep appreciation now for chaos and not having control because it's totally. out of your hands. Totally. But, but it's funny how you bring up that you read the book, you know, 15 years ago, I, I had a situation where I was doing the same preparing for a conversation here for, with a book that I had read maybe in 2004, 2005, and I was going through it, skimming the different sections, get a, getting a feel for it again. And all the areas that were highlighted or like there were margin notes that I had left, I read it. I'm like, what does that even mean? <laughs> because I was in such a different point in my life. Right? I was like, I got to get successful, got to get successful. And then everything that really stood out now had nothing to do with those previous notes. So it's just interesting that you had kind of that same thing where new yeah. things jumped out at you. Evolution though, right? Like you you have to, I'm, I'm just, yeah, I'm such a huge believer in, you just got to get comfortable with the uncomfortable and you've got to be prepared to make significant change if you want to see significant change. And I think that's a huge, to your point, a huge thing of what happened during, um, during COVID is that, you know, we saw all this, craziness happening around us. And like, we were just shocked into this new way of, of living and kind of locked down. And then you couldn't travel and you couldn't, you know, see loved ones. And then they brought in, depending on what part of the world you're in, like they, some places brought in these vaccination passes where certain parts of the community were being just like, you can't go here. You can't do those things. You can And just for me as a leader, I remember sitting back and watching these things happen and watching, you know, going from this life where my husband and I were just jet setting around and we're like literally meeting for coffee in the airport. What time's your flight, my flight? And then I just remember having this profound moment of like, I need to seek significant change here because um, number one, I'm not, I'm not going back to this life where we never see each other. And I was like, I actually really love you. Like I love spending all this time with you yet. We have built and designed this life that is counterintuitive to, to doing the things that bring us great joy and purpose. And then, you know, on top of that, just watching from a leadership perspective, I just found it really fascinating watching, 
you know, how Canada was managing COVID versus how places in Europe and how the US. And I was like, man, like all these different leaders in all these different parts of the world managing the same problem mm -hmm. yet really differently. And like, honestly, I'm considering, you know, going to do my PhD in leadership and studying that particular nuance of how you could have all these different uh, leadership responses to this, you know, this great um, issue that was happening around the world. Um, I, just, I just find that so fascinating. Um, so yeah, yeah for most of, for most of our conversation, we've been talking mostly about organizations, but cultural differences in leadership, that's an entirely different oh. beast. I'd be curious what you come out with after your doctorate, uh, what you might write after that, but that's just something completely entirely different just because yeah. of how much of that culture leaks into organizational decisions and cultural decisions and whatnot. So that's a beast to tackle. Oh, right. And it's, um, yeah, I, I just find it fascinating. I just think lead leadership has profound impacts long past the moment of leadership. And it's like that whole systems thinking, right? Gosh, if I'm going to show up this way and this is how I'm going to lead the team, okay, but like, what's going to happen next month, next week, a year from now, what's going to happen to this team that works with that team? What's going to happen to, it's just, yeah, it's, uh, it's my jam. Like, honestly, <laughs> I could just, uh, I just find it fascinating because it has such, to your point, ripple effects all yeah. over the place come from how leaders show up to do their job. Laura, and then one thing before we wrap up, I was curious, what kind of specific behaviors did you take away from the book? So you've shared the ideas you've taken away from the book, um, some foundational things, but much the same way. And this, I, I was curious about this from the moment you mentioned he showed them how to put on their socks, uh, their basketball shoes, his notes. Were there any little tweaks in your behaviors or the way that you did things that kind of stem from reading the book and what coach Wooden prescribed for himself or did himself? Yeah, I think there's kind of two or three big things um, that I, that I took away and really changed about my leadership practice. And one was um, really related to communication specifically about how he taught, you know, to put your shoes on and how to put your socks on. Um, it really made me think about how I communicated as a leader. Um, am I impactful? Is the message getting through? Am I um, communicating things in a way that are practical and that makes sense to the people that I wish to lead? Am I at the 10,000 foot level instead of the 100,000 foot level? And that changed based on the organization that I was with, like the, tent, the basketball shoe analogy changed based on what type of team I was leading. Um, but that fundamental that it really just comes down to communication. Are you at 10,000 feet? Are you reaching um, your team? Are they getting the message? Because if you can't communicate effectively as a leader, um, you're in big trouble. I always say now, like one of my Laura-isms that came out of reading this book is like communication uh -huh. is where leaders go to thrive or they go to fail. It's all based on how, how they communicate. So that was one. The other thing that I really changed... Um, or that was changed because of reading this book was about reflection. And that's that story about how he just like every single practice, man, I reflect more now than I, than I ever have. I've carried that practice throughout the whole last 15 years, daily journaling in the morning, end of day reflection, even now that like, I don't have a job and I'm not doing all these, you know, big career things. I reflect every single day, like what brought me joy you know, what did I see high impact from? What did I really love doing that I want to do more of? What did I do today that like didn't didn't sit well? I think about my conversation. I, I reflect about everything. And then I try and pull the threads together um, so that I can continue to develop. Um, and that's probably the third thing that I really took away is that, you know, if you want to be at your competitive greatness best, no matter where it is in life, whatever you're doing, you need to continually prepare for that. And that just set me on this journey of like self-development nerdism. Like I just can't help myself, whether it's like I, that spurred me on to do my master's degree. Then I took this communication course and I'm constantly reading um, a multitude of books and I just, I just can't help myself because I know that it's just going to continue to 
feed my soul and it's just going to continue to help set me on this path of, of, you know, competitive greatness, wherever that, wherever that may lead to. And that's part of your freedom. That's part of that freedom. Your dad had spoken about, you know, yeah. like if, if you don't have to worry about communism, you know, somebody invading your country and limiting your, your beliefs, limiting your, your, whatever your resources, whatever it may be. It, when you look at it like that, it's a blank canvas. It's up yes. to you what you want to, what you want to design and paint. So yeah. I think anything like that, I, I don't know, like to me, my parents' immigrant story compared to now, I don't have the pressures that they did. I'm a little mm -hmm. more secure than they are. That's based on the hard work they did to get me yeah. to where I am. All the all the 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 bottom level of Maslow's hierarchy, the security, the food, the needs, all the physical stuff is taken care of. And that gives me more freedom to kind of create what I want, you know, from that line up. So yeah. that's the way I see it. It's just so much that's freedom. Fun. It's beautiful, just you know that typical immigrant story. They want better for their kids, so and you know here we are. Yeah, he, uh, Coach Wooden, calls it um, this philosophy of like making each day your masterpiece, whatever it is that you're doing. And I just think just how inspiring that is because that that lies within each of us to. It's mm -hmm. like the four agreements, right? Just like do what you say you're gonna do. Don't take it personally do your best don't make assumptions and just like, <laughs> i'm telling you each of those in that book i'm like oh my god this guy's right and they're just so simple but yes. again the way he i love the way that's written just because it seems like he's in your ear like walking yes. you through it because he, well, he, it's almost like he knows where we're going to trip up and what we're going to believe and, and what we're going to doubt so just the way he walks through each of those that you just listed thank yeah. you because my memory is absolute shit. i appreciate that you were able to list them out uh, I highly, I always highly recommend that book as well. Oh man. Like I, the, I have it on my, on my wall for a reason, right? Cause we all have those little, little angels and demons that sit on our shoulder. And for me, it's like the, don't take it personally and don't make assumptions. What are you missing in the story, Laura? What facts are you trying to slot in there yourself? Like just yeah. go out, get clear, don't make assumptions and don't take things personally, man. I don't know if it's age or if it's wisdom or a combination of both, but oh my God, the amount of my youth that I invested in worrying about what people think about me and taking things so personally and yeah, don't, don't go down that road, friends. Uh, no, it's not worth it. Laura, as we come into wrapping up, is there anything that you want to share about what you're up to these days or any kind of information you want to provide? I'll provide you know, your links and your contact information, if you like, when I post this, but if there's anything that else you want to share about what you might have coming up at all, just please share. Yeah. I just think the, the only thing I, that I would share, John, is that, um, man, just get jacked about leadership, whatever that means for you. Just like, you know, find a way to get inspired. If I can help with that, you know, go over to my website. Um, I do, you know, some speaking events. I do a few things virtually as well. Um, if you think that um, that I might be able to help you or your team or your department, um, reach out. Like I'm, I'm, I'm super game to just spread the gospel of the power of great leadership with anyone who will listen. But I think, yeah, my my biggest message is just if you are leading people. Um, find the purpose in that, find the passion for that, and just continue to invest in yourself so that you can invest in um, those that you wish to lead. Awesome. Wooden on Leadership, How to Create a Winning Organization is the book we just covered. Laura, thank you so much for um, not bringing the book to my attention. I had heard of it, but just really breaking down um, just the urgency and the depth of uh, Coach Wooden's message. I think it's powerful. Uh, it, I'll, it's definitely on my list to read. So I appreciate you just, you know, spending your time here discussing your background, your experience in this book. Yeah, no, thank you so much for having me, John. It was amazing. Uh, really, really great to, to connect with you and, uh, and talk about coach Wooden. Yeah. Two leadership nerds having at it. <laughs> But if there's anything that I might have missed in talking to Laura, um, I've kept her here over an hour, but I could ask so many more questions. If there's anything that I might have missed or should have brought up, please reach out to me and let me know. I'll reach out to her, see if she can provide some information, some follow up. In the meantime, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. And I'll talk to you soon in the next episode. Take care. Bye.